All right, cotton is ultimately going to transform not only the economy of the United States, but the whole world, and it's going to lead us into the Industrial Revolution. Industrial Revolution really just means a um, transition, again, from an agricultural-based economy towards an economy that is focused on manufacturing goods, uh, producing things like clocks or shoes or saddles or, you know, uh, cloth garments. Okay, so we're, we're going to focus, refocus the economy away from agriculture to the Industrial Revolution. This is a slow thing that happens over the course of the 19th century, and it happens in d uh, different places, different times. So it's most advanced in Britain in the um, <clears throat> first half of the 19th century. It really doesn't get to the United States until after the Civil War. So, you know, before the Civil War, um, the United States is still primarily an agricultural economy. But we are producing the raw materials that are generating that industrial revolution in Britain and in other parts of Europe. Okay, that's the cotton, right? That's kind of the central raw material there for this whole thing. Okay, and um, <clears throat> this whole thing is um, making people in the uh, United States extraordinarily wealthy, right? It's also something that is, it's not just the Southerners who are benefiting from it, right? The New England merchants are the ones often who are transporting the cotton out to Europe, right? And the uh, New York financiers and bankers are uh, providing loans for farmers to establish farms, are providing loans to merchants to ship the cotton overseas. There's also uh, a lot of investment being attract uh, that's, um, being attracted from Europe. So rich people or bankers in Europe uh, providing loans for people to produce more cotton as well. So there's a there's a lot of different people who are benefiting from this whole thing, right? Um, the profits can also be, you know, the uh, useful to the government, right? Because the federal government can tax cotton as it's being exported or manufactured goods as they're coming in. So the federal government is also benefiting and is able to start paying down the interest on the horrible foreign debt that it's owed, right, since the, since the Revolutionary War and then the War of 1812, right? <clears throat> so there's lots of people that are benefiting from this whole thing, and of course it's all being produced by the slave labor. All right, now, um, <clears throat> you know, the um, even though the United States remains focused on primarily an agricultural economy, you do get a few spots where we have the introduction of manufacturing in the United States tied to the cotton industry. And this is going to be in Massachusetts. Okay. Now, <clears throat> part of what happens is, of course, during the War of 1812, right, the trade between New England and uh, Britain is interrupted, right? And so a couple of guys from New England, from Boston, get together and say, look, we need to do something about this. We need to not be dependent on <clears throat> Britain for producing the cloth garments. Because look, what, what we're doing is we're sending the cotton over there, they're producing the garments, and then they're sending them back and we're purchasing from them, right? First of all, we can't even do this because there's this war that's interrupting it. Second of all, uh, this is stupid. Why don't we just make the garments here? So this guy, Francis Cabot Lowell, uh, partners with uh, Patrick Jackson and Nathan Appleton, and they create something called the Boston Manufacturing Company. And their goal is that they, they want to build a textile factory in a production center in Massachusetts. And they want to use a power loom, right? They want to use a water powered loom. This is what the British are using to great effect, in, uh, especially in and around the city of Manchester um, in more like the north of England. Okay, now the, the power loom this is this mechanized loom, usually driven by a water source, had been developed by Edward Cartwright. It's a British invention, and the British government was guarding it very quickly. But they, they did allow visitors to come in and look at the factories, but they were very careful that the um, visitors would not get, uh, would not be able to obtain the plans of Cartwright so that they could not replicate the um, power loom in other places. But Lowell, this, uh, this fella, Francis Cabot Lowell, is like a genius with like a photographic memory, right? And he's able to, he, he, he's allowed into these factories in, uh, <clears throat> in Manchester. And um, 
and again, this is kind of remarkable because the United States is at war with Britain, okay, but they're allowing this guy Lola in there to come in there and look at the factories. Anyway, he looks at, you know, the power loom and he just kind of memorizes the structure of the power loom. And then he comes back and in 1814, he's got this mechanic that he teams up with, Paul Moody. And they come up with a plan for their own water-powered loom and they present it to the directors of the Boston Manufacturing Company, right? Saying, look, just give us a little bit of capital, give us a little bit of money, we'll build this loom and we'll make a lot of money for everybody, okay? And so the directors think this is a great idea and um, <clears throat> there are three textile mills that Lowell establishes at Waltham, uh, outside of Waltham, Massachusetts, okay? And they are producing impressive results, producing a lot of cotton garments and making a good profit from it, okay? And so the shareholders, the people that own um, <coughs> shares of the company, they own parts of the company, they want to grow this thing bigger. And so they establish a town to go along with the factories so that the town, as the town grows in population, the factories can also grow in population. You can produce more cloth and have more workers, okay? And so they established this town of Lowell, Massachusetts, and this becomes kind of the center of uh, industrial manufacturing in America before the Civil War. And they, um, <clears throat> they're producing the cotton garments and they're employing young women from the region, women who grew up on farms, worked on farms. And these, these uh, young girls say, well, they're, you know, they're in their late teens and 20s. They put in long hours, but they receive a steady wage and they get to live in town and they get to enjoy like, you know, certain diversions that towns have like, you know, stores or uh, libraries or lectures or churches and you know, different types of churches. So <clears throat> this is kind of like a nice fun thing for some of the girls to do, be a little bit independent, send some money home to the farm. But they usually only do it for a couple of years before they get married, right? And so these girls, um, <clears throat> you know, it's a temporary job for them. So you don't have a kind of entrenched permanent factory worker population, which might start to resent the fact that it's kind of um, maybe not being treated well or paid enough by the owners. And so you don't have the kind of tensions between workers and the owners that you're going to have in uh, U.S. factories after the Civil War, right? Because you just have this kind of transitory moving population. The girls come in, work for a few years, get married, leave, and you bring in a new generation, okay? And uh, Lowell is really, again, the uh, centerpiece and, and the heart of industrial manufacturing in the U.S. before the Civil War, okay? Relying also on that uh, cotton industry.